Yes, you are. You are finally here. I've been waiting to check this one out for quite some time now. Hi guys, Matthew here and welcome back again to my channel. It's been a while since I've tried Logitech's first ever wireless mechanical gaming keyboard, their G613 model. I remember that thing being really bulky and it had no backlighting for the keys. And this new G915 model is about to change that completely. The G915 actually came just a bit before the new G Pro X model, which I reviewed just as it came out. Feel free to check it out in the right top corner of this video. And it's also being described as a mechanical gaming keyboard, but with a few twists around it, one in particular, that it's completely wireless. I really like how this model looks and feels, it's well built although it has a really thin profile and feels a bit fragile at first, but it's not. It's really sturdy thanks to this top aluminum cover which slopes to the right and left side of the keyboard and gives it that more premium and elegant look. Too bad they didn't do the same for the back and front side, but you instead have these pretty sharp edges and I could see a scenario where I scrape myself on it. Overall, the design is kept simple and clean, typical for Logitech, with few cool details like this volume wheel which is sort of like half-baked into this top right edge of the keyboard and which has that ultra silky smooth feeling when you start to roll it. Although there were some reports of it having a noticeable delay when using it, I didn't have any problems with that, it's possible that they did a firmware update which addresses this particular issue. As I said, the profile of the keyboard is really thin, basically half of the height of my DAS Keyboard 4 professional model, which is kinda impressive considering it's a fully mechanical keyboard in question. Because of that low profile nature, you basically don't need any wrist rest, and if you really need something soft below them, you could go for a big mouse pad, because otherwise with anything else you would probably rise your wrists too high in relation to the keyboard itself, which would fatigue your hands. That's the exact setup I have here and I found it to be true, plus I didn't use the angle adjustment option cause I really didn't need it, although you can if you wish to, because you'll find two dedicated standoff feet on each corner of the keyboard's back portion with two levels of adjustment. Getting back to the top side of the keyboard, I'm also liking the fact that they put rubberized caps for these dedicated multimedia and other function keys, it feels a bit more premium in a way, instead of just regular plastic caps which you usually find in those places, but I do wonder how long will they last until the rubber starts to slowly peel off, although I think it won't happen in a short time span since these are not used that often. Speaking of the keys, the layout is pretty simple, we have the basic portion with your standard keys layout and numpad, and the additional portion with those rubber set of keys for controlling the media, changing the type of connection, I will talk about that a little bit later on, as well as for changing to different user profile or recording a macro on the fly, game mode and brightness key, while on the left side we have 5 dedicated and fully programmable G keys, and honestly I'm glad to see them here, as I haven't seen those in a while. What's also new about this model is that it carries Logitech's first ever low profile mechanical GL switches, this one in particular being the GL Clicky. Of course, besides them, you have a choice to get the GL Linear or the GL Tactile types of switches, which obviously have a different specs and feel to it compared to these ones I have here. They are all actually made in partnership with Kale, which basically made this segment popular over the last few years, which is why we now get to see them working together in one of the most ambitious crossover event in history, after of course the Infinity Wars. As you can see they don't sink in below the top plate, but they rather stick out, basically their basis is in line with the top plate itself, similarly to their G512 model, which gives it this open style industrial feel to it. They also probably did this so they can have a more low profile housing for it, although I do wonder what it would look like if they buried them in a few millimeters below that top plate, but I assume it would be pretty challenging to pull it off in a way that everything again fits in without actually changing the volume of the keyboard's housing. You would think that this type of placement would raise up the overall height of the keys, which would render the low profile switches somewhat useless in relation to the keyboard's overall height, especially in this case where you have a really thin housing, but Logitech also made sure that they've put a really low profile keycaps on them. 
The keycaps are easily removable, they have these two hook pins that latch onto the plastic part of the switch which moves up and down. They do look a bit fragile if you ask me, I never had a good lasting experience with this kind of plastic parts which are sticking under a right angle while also being thin, so be careful when pulling them out or plugging them in. What's also a bit concerning is that they didn't use PBT for their build, which is a bit surprising considering the high price point for this keyboard, but on the other hand Logitech says they did put some kind of coating on the keycaps so they don't wear out over time and so they don't have that oil look and feel to them. Back to the switches. Honestly, although they do sound really cool at first, they are a bit too clicky for my taste, which can get a bit wearisome on the long run. Here's how they sound compared to their similar brothers, the GX Blue clicky switches on the G Pro X model. On the other hand, as I mentioned, they do offer other flavors of switches for this model, the GL Tactile and GL Linear, and I assume that the GL Tactile is something along the line of the Cherry MX Brown switch when comparing their specifications, on which I'm typing for close to 4 years now, and I feel it hits the right spots of being a good all-arounder for a majority of users, and for me personally, when it comes to how it feels and handles, so I assume that the GL Tactile is pretty similar to it. In terms of the performance, I had no complaints whatsoever, I didn't feel any delay on account of it being wireless, thanks to the Logitech's low latency light speed technology or otherwise. As you've probably noticed and as I already talked about it, the G915 supports different types of wireless connections, one being the aforementioned low latency light speed 2.4 GHz technology using a standard USB dongle, while the other one is Bluetooth. You can easily jump between them using that dedicated switch, but what I've noticed is that the Bluetooth connection doesn't support jumping in between few paired Bluetooth devices, as seen on some of their other products, like their new MX Master 3 mouse. Still, it's an awesome feature to have, comes in handy if you for example have to type something longer on your smartphone. Being a wireless mechanical gaming keyboard with RGB backlighting, it's not hard to guess that you'll have to scramble for battery life. It would be awesome if they could make a large sized wireless charging mat, which could both cover charging of your wireless mouse and keyboard, and I'm hoping that we will get that soon enough since they already have their power play technology of wireless charging mats for their mice. But it's not all bad news because you can drastically increase the battery life just by lowering the brightness intensity by one scale, you can get around 60 hours of autonomy instead of 34 hours, and 137 hours on the lowest brightness settings, while turning it completely off you will get roughly 1100 hours between charge. The charging is done over a micro USB port, yeah again with the micro USB port, although some of their other products already have USB Type-C ports, but ok, it's only for occasional charging. Logitech made that process a bit easier for us, with bundling this micro USB to USB Type A dongle, in which you can just put the receiver and tuck it away together with the cable somewhere on the side, and once you need that cable for charging you can just pull it out and connect it to the keyboard. The backlighting for the keys is really excellent, everything is evenly lit and very true to color, the keys, or the lettering to be precise, looks crisp and bold, by the way, the secondary symbols are not lit, as you've probably noticed, and there's basically no light bleed around the keycaps, although they are completely open from the bottom. The only thing I do resent them a bit is the fact that those dedicated switches for the profiles and other functions don't change the color together with the standard keys, so it does trigger my OCD a bit in that regard, although I do see logic in doing what they did, it's a bit easier to pick them out among others. Since we are already here looking at Logitech's G-Hub utility software, as with any of their other G products, here you can customize your LightSync RGB backlighting, being it using traditional presets or by creating your own animations or freestyle effects, set up your G keys using actions, macros or other commands for all of your available 3 different profiles, and also customize your game mode. With this model Logitech is slowly but surely moving to my dream keyboard setup, so I'm hoping they will release a 10 keyless version of this model soon, together with some other minor improvements and polishing out the mansion quirks, and that would probably be it for me.
I can completely understand why they didn't went this route right away as TKL models are generally selling slower. But the thing is that a 10 keyless version of this model would go perfectly hand in hand with this thin profile because otherwise this keyboard is still a massive one on account of its surface area so it being thin doesn't help that much in that regard. On the other hand the biggest hurdle you'll have to cross over with this particular model even if you really want it, is the fact that it has a price tag of $250. Yeah, that's really up there, like really, really up there. But I was expecting something along the line of this, since it's wired brother, the G815, which is basically the same model, but with an added USB pass-through connection, has an also pretty spicy price tag of $200. Is that a lot? Yes, it is. Will it sell? Yes, it most certainly will. I have no doubts about it. That's it for this time for me. Thank you once again for watching. Toss me a thumbs up if you enjoyed my content. That really helps a lot. And if you like what you saw, feel free to subscribe. And if you already are, be sure to press that notification bell down below so you don't miss out on a new video. And until then, catch you later, guys.